Welcome to Study Isaiah, the podcast in which we examine the language, context, and meaning of the book of Isaiah with Dr. Paul Wegner. I'm Tyler Sanders, and with me is Paul Wegner, who's going to tell us the Hebrew word of the day. And this one is a little different than what we normally have, because this word means a whole bunch of different things. This is not multiple choice. No, no. It, it's it's the word pakad. Pakad. And it can mean to visit, to make careful inspection, to look at, to instruct, to punish, to visit for good, and even more. So what I did is I gave you a, a, a verse here where I'm going okay. to show you an example. Okay. So Isaiah 24, 21. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of the heaven on high and the kings of the earth. Uh, and the kings of the earth on earth. So the, it's our word, will punish. Okay? okay. All right. Now, what I did next is show here. Here's like a range of meanings. So what I did is I made a, a circle with all the different options in it. And just to let you know, each context, when you read it, will help you to know, narrow it down, what does it mean in this specific context? Yeah. But it, that's the range of meanings. And to that's, visit is often, and usually it means to visit. For when God visits somebody, it's usually with oh, judgment. Okay. Yeah. But as you can notice, sometimes it's for good too. So well, that's a pretty big range. Yeah. That, that's that's why when I started looking at it, I thought, oh, that's an interesting word because it, it can be used so many different ways. Yeah, to visit for good would be very different to, than to punish. To punish, yeah. So in its all context, it's going to help you yeah. kind of discover this. Yeah. So I, I, my understanding is that probably the core is to visit. But then the context will help you know, okay, how is, how, is he going to visit him, them in judgment? Is he going to visit them to look over what their, their um, you know, works are like? Or is he going to come with blessing to them? So I, I assume the core is that God is coming to examine something, and then he'll either judge it or uh, bless them or whatever. So I think that's it. Let me ask you something. Okay. Off. This is on topic, but it's a little bit... It could be a bit of a rabbit trail. Okay. A word like this. Mm -hmm. How do we, uh, as modern readers, learn that there's this range of yeah. definitions for it? Maybe like, I'm, I'm kind of at an academic level. Like, yeah. Well, you know. how I did it. Because um, I, I, I went to a lexicon and looked at um, the different uses of the word, and then I went to each of the passages to see if, yeah, it really mm. does mean that. So basically what you do is you go to a passage and see if the context helps you to know how that word should be shaped in that context. Yeah. So that's how I did it and came up with all these different meanings. And lexicon it, guides you through the Bible to tell you where all the references essentially are. Yeah. For for yeah, a word and like this. I was using um, uh, Lagos, and you can you can oh, basically sure. look up and see um, in the lexicon what the words mean, and then just hover over it, and it'll it'll take you to the passages. And I did that just to make sure that yeah, yeah. These, these words really this do works. mean all these. It does make sense. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, that's very. Uh, that's great. That's a good word, Picard. And, and we hadn't we hadn't had anything like this before, so I thought yeah. that that's should be helpful to help us learn how some of these words can be have a variety of meanings. Yeah, and it doesn't mean multiple choice. No, it no. still has a very specific meaning in that specific passage because yeah. some of them won't make sense in that passage. Yeah. So yeah. So context will help us. Yeah, that's great. So these are these are just some of the passages to visit uh, Judges fifteen one. Oh. But after a while, at the same time, or at the time of wheat harvest, it came about that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. Yeah. So see, yeah, that yeah, that's does not make a punishment sense. Punishment thing. Yeah. yeah. To check over us, uh, and Saul said to the people who were with him, "Number now and see who has gone from us." So when it says number, it it actually means to go and check out who's here and who's not here. Mm. And they found out that David wasn't, uh, and his uh, oh, right. armor bearer weren't together. Yeah. And then to miss, if your uh, second uh, first Samuel twenty six, if your father misses me at all, so there is that word pakat again. Um, and in Jeremiah, I had one that I thought was real interesting. There uh, in Jeremiah thir uh, twenty three two. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and not attended to them. That's, the, that's our word. Uh, behold, I'm about to attend to you. So see, he's actually oh, using the yeah. same word yeah. to actually, uh, it'll have a slightly different meaning, but it's actually, it, in the Hebrew, you can catch that it's the same word that God's yeah. going to... And remember, one of them is to, to, to visit them with judgment, yeah. and that's what that second one means right. almost certainly. Right. 
So that's that, that, that was helpful to just to see what's going on in some of those. Yeah, it was very helpful. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's all. Th this will be our next one, but, but that's, those are some of the ways that those, that word can be used. Yeah. Picard. So. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a great word. Um, well, let's get into the text, because this word shows up in chapter 24. Yep. And 24 is where we're starting off today. Yes. And if you remember, we have done the oracles to the nations, so that was that whole major yeah. section we did last week. Now we're going to do the little apocalypse, mm -hmm. which is basically, uh, it gets that name because it's got some similar things to what's in the book of Revelation. Oh, and, okay. and remember, that's called the apocalypse of John. So, yeah. so it's that idea of, um, it actually, that word can mean to reveal or to, to even to um, have... Apocalypse can mean to reveal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's actually uh, the Greek form of it can actually mean to reveal or to um, something like that even, some kind of revelation. Yeah, uncover or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So... Well, I love the title, Little Apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's little because it's short. Yeah. It does, it does it. Yeah. But it's, it's really got some amazing things. In it. And if you remember some of the things in the book of Revelation, they'll be highlighted here again. So it'll mm. be interesting. Okay. Are we ready well, to yeah, get let's, in? Yeah, let's get into the text. All right. Um, Let's see. The, um, first of all, um, what I wanted to do is, because once again, just like in the other passages, there's so much in there. What I'll try to do is try to highlight certain verses. So um, I'm going to start at verse 1 to give you basically the background. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its, its inhabitants. So that sounds just like in the past when we had all those nations that were going to be destroyed. Yeah. Well, now... It's now the whole earth is going to be destroyed. Right. Okay. So that's that's it. Now look at verse two, and the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower. So basically, it's going to go through and say, there is no the society has just been turned Everything on its is, head. Everything's flipped over. Yeah. And so so there's no there's no higher person than anything. And my guess is because it's all being destroyed, everybody's just running for their lives is probably yeah. what's going on. And that this is often called a topsy-turvy world. Mm -hmm. um, if you see it in other... And um, in, in, in it's throughout the ancient Near East, there are other uh, books that actually talk about this oh, topsy-turvy world things. But it's it's when destruction comes on a nation or something like yeah. that, and, and things are just in turmoil, yeah. basically. Wow. Okay. Well, that's so, fascinating. Yes. Yeah, so I wouldn't that's, have expected that. That's what this is talking about. Now look at verse three. Uh, the, the earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. So whenever God does that, it's, it's letting you know that this is a certain, this is really going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's what we've got so far. Now, it's, so it's going to tell us about the destruction, but now in verse five, it tells us why, the reason. All right, so verse 5, the earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Um, the everlasting covenant is probably the covenant that God made with creation back in Genesis 9. Do you remember in Genesis 9, after the flood, yeah. God actually makes this um, covenant with the, with the world and says, yeah. okay, um, if people kill other people, they should be killed. Um, if, um, you know, it, it goes back and, and basically kind of has some basic understandings of how you're supposed to live on this world. And that's probably what's the everlasting covenant. So they've even broken that. So most of it is talking about killing other people. Well, you'd have thought they could at least have done that to keep right. this covenant. And right. even they've broken that covenant. And because that's broken, that's now we're getting into this. Do. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So that's that's basically what we got so far. Now go to verse six. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, there, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are left burned with uh, with few men, and few men are left. Hmm. So we've got a, a destruction of the world with few men left. Now, if you if you went to the book of Revelation. You, you remember the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments and the seal judgments? It goes through the earth, and like a third of the earth is destroyed at one point and yeah. stuff like that. So it's, it's at that point, um, it's very similar to the kind of destruction talked about here. Mm. So I just wanted to point that out because those are the similarities you're going to constantly be seeing through here. Yeah. Okay? Okay. All right? Um, 
if you go to verse seven, you've got uh, seven through 12 and, and we don't, I'll just read a part of it, but basically it sounds like the joy has been taken away from the world. Okay, so look at verse uh, 7. The new, mu- the new wine mourns, the vine decays, the merry-hearted sigh, the gaiety of the tambourine ceases, the sound of the reveler stops, the gaiety of the harp ceases. So it basically goes through and says, there's no more joy on earth. Well, there wouldn't be if God's going to destroy it. And basically uh, what you've talked about in the first couple of verses, there wouldn't be any reason for joy. Yeah. And so, so it's a, about seven, well, about five verses of explaining that it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me ask you. Yeah. Because this, you know, uh, you know, people who are reading along will probably notice this is laid out slightly differently. Yeah. Which, you know, a lot of times I think indicates like this could be like poetic yes. or a song. Or what are we looking at right yeah. now? Yeah. Now we have the, songs coming up. I think right. Uh, say like yeah. songs like some, yeah yeah some song formats several chapters up yeah yeah. Yeah. So is this similar to that? Is that kind of what we're looking at? or? Well, what is interesting is that this chapter seems to be split. The first um, six verses mm-hmm. seem to be narrative. There's not much... Yeah. Uh, usually how you can tell if uh, in Hebrew there's narrative is if there's repetition. Parallelism is a real important thing for poetry. Yeah. Well, if 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 there's none of that, then it's probably narrative. Yeah. If it's... Now look at down in verse 7. The new wine mourns. Uh, the 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 vine decays, mm-hmm. the merrymaker's heart sigh. You can see those are those are like building, yeah, uh, and those are parallel units, probably yeah. building. So it does make sense that probably starting at verse seven, you do have uh, now a poetry. Mm-hmm. And usually, what happens in in the book of Isaiah anyway? There's statements made, and then there's this poetic. Uh, explanation of how bad it is. Or you might have just the opposite. Like in one of the oracles of the nation, you had the poetic stuff first mm. and then the narrative. Yeah. So so the order could be switched around. This one seems to be the narrative first and then the poetry. Yeah. But the poetry then just enhances just how bad the destruction is going to be. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So that's that seems to be what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right. Now in verse 13, look what it says. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth, among the peoples, as the shaking of an olive tree, the gleanings when the grape harvest is over. So what it just did, it told you two different things talking about um, when, when, the, when they go through the harvest, the gleanings. That means the things that are left. So okay. basically it's saying that once, once they've gone through and harvested a, a crop, there's going to be a few grapes still yeah, left on the missed, vine, yeah. or there's still going to be a few olives still in the tree. Uh-huh. But that'll be for gleaning. That'll be the leftovers, basically. Yeah. So, so he's saying there's going to be so few people left that it'll look like, like after gleaning. some... Yeah, like wow. some nation has been harvested. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right. Then verse 14... They raise their voices, they shout for joy, they cry out from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore glorify the Lord in the east, the name of the Lord of the God of Israel in the coastlands of the seas. From the edges uh, from the ends of the earth we may hear songs, glory to the righteous one. What's that? You know, you have what sounds like earth being destroyed with no joy and no, nothing anywhere, and then you've got God being praised. What's going on? My guess is it means that there's going to be a ref, uh, a remnant of people mm. that will still praise God. So mm. even after destruction on most of the world, there's going to be this remnant that's still going to be left that will be praising God. So I think that's what that's talking about. I was going to ask if the yeah. the they um, mm. in these in these passages it begins. You know, they raise their voices, they shout for joy. That's referring back to those. Kind of the glean, like it, the leftover. That probably and, is in this passage, yeah. 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 Which would be a remnant in a way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it fits really well in that context. And big picture, that makes a lot of sense because we've been told several times in the book of Isaiah that God is going to do a serious destruction. Yeah. And then and then a remnant is going to be brought out of that. Mm-hmm. So so it fits the book of Isaiah really well too. Yeah. But it also fixes the book of Revelation because it talks about a time at the end when yeah. God's going to be judging the earth. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, what's interesting, in the middle of verse 16, um, so I just talked about, uh, um, from the ends of the earth we hear songs, glory to the righteous one. But I say, woe is me, woe is me, alas for me. 
that's in the middle of that verse. Why yeah. did it switch from one yeah. to the other? My guess is that I and me are talking about Isaiah. He's probably watching this vision, and he's even though there is a remnant that's praising God, he's seeing the vast majority of destruction and, and stuff like that. So he's feeling the woe on himself. He's saying, oh yeah. man, look at this destruction. Yeah. And, and so I think that's what's going on. So it, it's, there, there is this remnant that's praising God in the midst of all this destruction. But Isaiah says, but the big part of it, the main part of it is the earth being destroyed. Yeah. So he's, he's really s- sad about that. Yeah. He's responding mm-hmm. to it, really. Yeah. Now, look, it says, the treacherous deal treacherously. The treacherous deal very treacherously. Remember I told you that when things are repeated like that, mm-hmm. it's to add emphasis? So so it's telling you that this is a time... Treachery is probably one of the worst things. What it's doing is it's people being mean to other people. And so it's... I, the, Isaiah, the author, I think, sees this at a, as a time of real destruction, and yeah. the people ripping other people off and all that. So the yeah. sin in this time period is also very, very relevant to wow. the destruction that's coming. That's interesting. Yeah. So I think that's how I'm seeing it anyway. And the next part is going to let us know that there's no escape from it. Look at verse 7. The tear and the pit and the snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees from the report of the disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. Do you see what that's saying? That's saying you can run as much as you want. You're not going to get away from this destruction. Yeah. So this destruction is coming, and you're going to be caught in it. Yeah. Okay? So that's, that, that, that verse 18 makes it real clear. You can't get away from it. All right? Now, look at the, the verse 21. And this is where... Now, before I do that, look at verse 20. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. It totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it. It will fall never to rise again. Well, that, that actually tells us two things. Um, first of all, it's, it's a brilliant picture, right? Here's a person that's drunk who's mm-hmm. so inebriated he can't even stand up. So he's tottering back and forth, and then in the end he just falls down and he's, he's gone. Yeah. Well, it, that's that's the picture of what the earth, because of the sin that's on it so much, it's like destroying it. Yeah. Okay? But then look at that last verse, it, or part of the verse. It will fall never to rise again. So this sounds like to me, it's talking about the end of this time period of, mm-hmm. of, of the earth, when it's it's going to be towards its end, and it's not going to rise up again. Yeah. So my guess is that it's given us every indication this is a future time, it's at the end of time, and the destruction is going to wipe out the earth. Hmm. Now, later on in the book of Isaiah, we're going to find out that God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Right. Well, this part's emphasizing the part of the first one getting down, you know, being so inebriated or so yeah. drunk with all the sin that's in it. It it will never rise again. Well, reading through it, it seemed to me to kind of be well because verse twenty, you like you said, you know, we have like it's reeling back and forth like a drunkard, and and we didn't talk about it really, but uh, verse nineteen, it seems like a lot of this is referencing almost like earthquakes. Some of it could be. So I was wondering if that's is, is that kind of an image that maybe is like yeah. Now remember, this is kind of destruction on a level that like yeah. is really difficult to Imagine. recover from, and yeah. like yeah, I mean like yeah. the earth has been reshaped in a way. Yeah, I, I think now remember, part of it's figurative and mm-hmm. part of it's got that core of truth in it. Yeah. So so my 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 mind is probably uh, is is at the end that when God destroys it, He's going to use earthquake. He's He's going to use. You know, uh, hunger. He's going to use everything mm. to destroy these people. Mm-hmm. Um, earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, uh, those kind of things. Um, all of those kind of things can destroy people. And and even if it's somewhat figurative, I don't see any reason why he could use those things anyway to destroy uh, the earth. You know. Yeah. So so it would it would seem like to me, even if it's the core of it is figurative, it's still getting at. The destruction that's actually going to come on the earth. Yeah. So that part's clear, I think. Yeah. 
So, yeah. 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 It, 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 a lot of times they use images and stuff like that to just give you some clue as how bad it's going to be. Well, and that's like a part of a metaphor. Yeah. Really, you have to have something real and visceral yeah. that you're kind of making that, you're establishing that relationship. It's like this or, you yeah. know, uh, and, you know, an earthquake to me, it seems like that would probably be a... Yeah. Well, think... You can't prevent it. You know, there's... And predict yeah. it or really, I mean, it's just... Yeah. It's just destruction. Yep. And remember, earthquakes can start tsunamis, which would be a whole nother mm. way of destroying people. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have all kinds of that, I think. Yeah. Now, look at let's look at that next verse. This one is really interesting. Where are we at? 21? We're at verse 21. Verse 21. So it, it, uh, so it will happen in that day. So what day are we talking about? That day that the earth is reeling to and fro with yeah. all this destruction, right? That the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. Well, who are the hosts of heaven on high? I don't <laughs> want to answer that. <laughs> I want you to tell me. Yeah, well, do it. Uh, it, it seems like to me, okay, that what we just did is we used a mirrorism to get to get okay. from the highest yeah. heights to the lowest lows. Yeah. But I still think it's also getting it. So who's up in those heights that can the the host of heaven? It, it would seem like now. Often hosts are talking about the heavenly hosts. Mm-hmm. Often they're talking about angels. Often they're talking about the planets and stars and stuff like that. Okay. But it would seem like, in my mind, why would planets and stars and stuff like that be destroyed unless somehow they've been affected by someone up in heaven that's that's corrupted them in some sense? Hmm. So it would seem like to me that a good, very reasonable explanation of this could be it's talking about demons or angels that are also going to be punished at the same time as kings of the earth are going to be destroyed. Wow. So if that's true, we've got... The hosts of heavens, meaning uh, angels or demons or um, you know things like that, being destroyed. And I don't rule out uh, planets and stuff like that because they would be affected. I'm sure by that. Um, mm-hmm. Part of the reason the Earth is being destroyed is because mankind are, is on it, right? And right. we've corrupted it, the Earth itself. Hasn't done anything wrong. It's mm-hmm. because mankind is on it that has corrupted it. Mm-hmm. So God has to punish the Earth. Because the earth is being affected because of us being on it. Right. Well, my guess is that's the same as the heavens. The heavens are being affected because of the angels or demons or mm. things like that that are up in them. Mm. So if it's if it's parallel to the earth at all, it would seem like both are being destroyed because of their connection with something that's with them. Yeah. So. Well, it's interesting. I mean, and you said it's a merism, but... Well, I think what's interesting about that is the low then on the side is still the king. It's like the yeah. leaders and the, yeah. you know, which is still a very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So so you're right. It's some kind of leaders are being yeah. punished. That would be like the leaders in the heavens being yeah. punished too. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my guess is uh, that it won't be just the kings of the earth. That kings might be a, mm. a figure of speech, meaning anyone who's oh, I wicked see. too. So I, I think it yeah, could yeah, fit yeah. that too. Yeah. So now look at okay. So that was that first one that that suggested that it sometimes in this end time or in the future for Isaiah, the the um, the you know the heavens the heavenly beings or whoever are going to be punished. And now look at verse twenty two. They will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon. They will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. Now that's really interesting because if you go to back to chapter uh, or to Revelation, the book of Revelation in chapter twenty, you have uh, starting in verses like one through eight, it talks about a destruction on people when when Jesus comes back and he's remember in chapter nineteen, Jesus comes back on a white horse and coming to rule, yeah. and then in chapter twenty it talks about the the wicked are going to be punished, the the righteous mm-hmm. are going to be saved, and then there's a uh, an image of what's called the millennium for a, for a thousand years. Uh, there's going to be this. It probably makes sense for us to go back to the book of Revelation. Is that all right with you? Sure. So why don't we go there and just see what I'm trying to say? Remember, it's called a little apocalypse for a reason. It's got similarities to what we have at the end times. We're going to what, uh, I'm Revelation going to, 20? Or yeah, 19? let's go to Revelation, Revelation 20. 20. Now, 
put your finger there for a minute, but let me read okay. this again. So it will happen in that day. So I'm back in Isaiah, right? So it happen, It will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. And they will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon and will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. So it sounds like they're going to be confined in a place for many days. And then after that, they're going to be punished. Yeah. Now, now let me read this. I'm, I'm back to Revelation now in chapter okay. 20. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding a key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into abyss and shut it and sealed over him so that he could not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Do you remember it said he was going to be thrown into yeah. a prison and there for a while, and then he's going to afterwards come out, mm. and he'd be confined was the word. Yeah. Then he's going to come out, and he's going to be punished. Well, right. this sounds very similar to what Revelation is telling us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so if this is, you know. Once again, a lot of people see this millennium as a figurative time period. Sure. But even if you do, it's it's figurative of what? You know, what's it describing? And it sounds like it's describing a time when Satan is going to be bound or curtailed, and then at the end he's let out. Well, that's what we were told in in the book of Isaiah. Yeah. So that once again, it's very similar. Okay. Well, and there's purpose to this release because it leads to punishment. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, once they're out, they're going to be... Um, it, we could read on. Um, the, um, during that millennium time, at verse 4 of chapter 20 in Revelation, it says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat, and they who sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received the mark on their forehead and on the hand. I don't know if you remember, but in the book of Revelation, it's talking about these people that had been spared out of this yeah. time of punishment and and they they received they didn't they refused to take the mark of the beast right. okay um and they came uh, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed after this uh, this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection for uh, over these things, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Now that, that was three times that it said they were going to reign with him a thousand years, right? Or yeah. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years and then they're going to reign for uh, twice. Okay. Then when the, uh, verse seven, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations uh, who are the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them together for a war, and the number of them is like the sand of the sea. So then uh, they're all going to be brought together. And then verse 10, and the devil who deceived them is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hmm. You know, when we think of the lake of fire, we we probably should be thinking that's hell. That's the, 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 um, the end the end time, yeah. the eternal punishment. That's yeah. usually what we call hell. Well, that's basically what Apparently, these guys are being thrown into. Right. So if that's true, that was that time of punishment that they were getting. Yeah. So after after yeah. we heard about this in Isaiah, Revelation seems to pick that up and take it even further and explain yeah. it even more. Right, right. So that's that's why it's there's some interesting connections. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's go back to Isaiah again. Okay. So we are in chapter 24, verse 23. When the, uh, when the moon will be abashed and the sun will be ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Now, that's interesting, that word, his elders. The only, the only thing I can think of is that in, back in Revelation, it talks about that there's going to be 24 elders reigning with him. And I think it's a summary of 12 of the uh, apostles, but also 12 of the tribes of Israel. Hmm. So it's taking a picture of all the people of God, Israel and the church, yeah. and putting them together and, and talking about the 24 elders. Well, this one, once again, mentions the elders again. Yeah. So I think, think it's helping us again know yeah. what's going to happen in the future. Right. right. Okay. Um, and then he saw... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's go to verse... Uh, oh, that's the end of chapter yeah, 24. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that gives us a, what looks like to me 
a pretty good understanding of what's happening. Now, there's more. Um, so I think we've, okay, I've, I've, I've talked about the confining him in prison and, and Revelation 20. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, oh, and then the Lord is going to reign on Mount Zion, okay? And then uh, the next chapter, when we get into chapter 24, it's going to be praising God. So we've, we've just got this, in 24, this earth being destroyed, um, the heavens... Uh, the hosts of heaven being punished, the kings on the earth being punished. Uh, then it goes into 25, where it's talking about praising God mm. for this great deliverance that he's bringing. So mm. the punishment is happening on the wicked, but there's going to be this great deliverance also from the rest of the people, Yeah, the remnant, we would call right. it. Right, right. Okay? Yeah. All right, let's look at it, because we've got some interesting things here. Let's, uh, the first part is just praising God. Um, uh, verse 2 is interesting. For you have made a city into a heap, a fortified city into a ruin. Uh, a, pal a palace of strangers is a city no more. So basically, he's destroyed these lofty cities, apparently. Yeah. Okay? Now, look at verse 4. For you have been a, ref, uh, a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. So basically it's saying why the destruction did come on those cities, God spared the, the, uh, yeah. uh, the needy and those in distress, and he's a refuge for those people. So it seemed like to me we've got a remnant being spared yeah. out of this great destruction. Right. Okay. Right. Um, it, it gives you what I think are some really brilliant images. Um, you know, refuge from the storm, um, a, a shade yeah, from the heat. Yeah. yeah. So those would be really good images to talk about the defense that God's been for these yeah. this remnant of His. Now look at verse six. Verse 6 says, The Lord of hosts will prepare, prepare a lavish banquet for all his people, peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, refined aged wine, and on this mountain... Oh, okay, so let me just stop there. So he's, he's preparing this banquet. In the book of Revelation, about chapter 19... It talks about something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right. When when God is going to have this banquet for His people. Um, in in verse uh, seven it says, "Let us rejoice." Uh, I'm in chapter tw uh, nineteen now of Revelation. Okay. okay. So nineteen verse seven, "Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready." It is given to her to clothe herself with fine linen, linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. So my understanding of the marriage supper of the Lamb is that the, the people of God, you know, God's holy ones, his, his people, are now going to have this, this banquet, to, and they're given white robes and stuff like that to be in this. Um, now, Take that back to what we've got in ver in this verse uh, in, in Revelation. Isaiah. Yeah. Oh, or, I'm sorry. In, in Isaiah. Isaiah, you're yeah. right. Um, it talked about this lavish uh, banquet uh, ho uh, for all the uh, all these people. Now look at verse seven. On this mountain, and usually the mountain is talking about Mount Zion. Yeah. So I assume that's where the wedding celebration or the the feast is going to be. On this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all people, uh, even the veil, which is stretched out over the nations. So usually, uh, some people have thought that that veil is uh, um, the, their uh, blindness and stuff like that. But mm. I think usually veils were, talked, were worn in mourning. So it sounds like what I think he's doing is he's taking away any reason for mourning. Right. Now, if that's true, we just had a banquet Usually, at, if it's a marriage banquet, like we've talked about in chapter 19 of Revelation, yeah. usually g in a Jewish wedding, gifts were given out to, mm. the, to the people that came. So he's actually, if, if that's the same kind of thing we have here, a wedding banquet, then he's, he's giving gifts to the people that mm. have come to it. And one of them would be he's taking away their mourning. Right. Okay, look at the next one. He will swallow up death for all time. That's a second gift he's given them. Yeah. So now there's not going to be any more death. And the Lord will wipe away uh, tears from their faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. So if that's true, and if this is a marriage feast, he's given gifts to the people that are there, and the gifts are things that 
once again, we'd never seen anything like it. It'd be right. no more death, no more mourning. Yeah. Um, he's going to remove, remove all the reproach for his people so that there's no reason, you know, they're going to be ashamed no more. They're going to be glorified. Yeah. So I, if, if this is how I understand it, it looks like to me that fits very well into the marriage supper of the Lamb that's talked about in Revelation 19. Yeah. So if so, that, that's another one that, that fits that yeah. Revelation pattern. No, it's very fascinating. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, now, um, look at verse... Uh, well, we're preparing the banquet, but look at verse 9. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited at that... Uh, that he might save us. For the Lord of whom we have waited, let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So that's like a climax. Here's here's this God that we've waited for who's now delivered us. Yeah. And, and now remember, at this point, it's primarily speaking to Israel, right? Israel is the one that that is going to get restored and stuff like this. When we get later on in the book, it's going to tell us that it's more than just Israel that's going to be restored. Hmm. It's going to be, they're going to be a remnant from multiple nations. And we kind of saw that already in the oracles to the nations. Remember yeah. those, those like in chapter 19, where we've got that, there's going to be a highway that comes from Assyria, right. one from Egypt. That's right. Yeah. They're going to be worshiping God together. Yeah. So you've got little hints of it here. And, and even here, you've got probably a little hint of it, but when you get to the book of Revelation, it's going, to, it's going to make, or I mean, the book, the latter part of the Isaiah, yeah. it's going to get real clear yeah. where there are other nations coming to God. Yeah. I and, mean, that's true in Revelation Yeah, yeah, as there well. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll get there in Isaiah too. Yeah, even Isaiah's talking yeah. about it. But that'll be later on. Yeah. All right. Does that make sense so far? So we've just gotten through, well, we're not even all the way through 25, but mm-hmm. it's, it's basically a, a song of praise praising God for what he's done for them. Yeah. And then it talks about this banquet, and he's giving these gifts to the people that come to the banquet, gifts that only a, a sovereign God could give, it seemed yeah. like to me. Right, right. Okay? All right. The next part is... Here's, here's uh, chapter 25, verses 7 and 8, where it talks about the groom gives boy, uh, gifts to the attendees, no mourning, no more death, no more tears, no more reproach. Yeah. Okay, then in verse 10, it starts talking about, and their, this might be also part of the presents that are given out, is that their enemies are going to be destroyed. And this one centers on Moab. Look what it had, mm. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab will be trodden down in its place, as straws, straws trodden down in the water of a manure pile, and he will spread out his hands in the middle of it as a swimmer spreads out his hands to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pride together with his trickery of his hands. So... So it sounds like what's happening is that Moab is probably being pictured as all of their enemies. Mm. Um, it's it, kind of figuratively, yeah, figuratively it, being added in there. Yeah, because um, other places, Esau um, is, uh, you know, Edom is mm. actually mentioned uh, mm. as being the one that God goes after and punishes. Um, we will have that. Uh, it was in one of the oracles to the nations, but we'll yeah. see it again. And and it's and it seems like he takes one of their major enemies and kind of says, "Okay, this is what's going to happen to them, and and God will punish them for their wickedness." Mm. So it's interesting, but yeah, it's interesting. He only takes one of the. I mean, there's there's lots of nations he could have said, but he just picks out Moab yeah. at this point. Yeah, and, and I don't think I necessarily. Imagine Moab as the chief enemy of yeah, yeah. Israel either. You yeah. know, like it's probably yeah. not where I would. Yeah, and then later he's going to say uh, Edom is going to be punished. He's yeah. going to come after Edom, and you go, okay, why Edom and not Assyria or Babylon? Well, he's already said he's going to get those, those ones, but he, he also has ones against Moab and Edom too. So it is interesting. In verse 11, when it says he will spread out his hands in the <laughs> middle of it, yeah. as a swimmer spreads out his hands to swim, what, yeah. is, what is that? Yeah, that's a good question, and, and okay. a lot of people are wondering. Yeah. Uh, from what I... I'm, if, if, uh, if, if they're spreading it out like this, it says about a swimmer. So a swimmer would push the water okay. away. So I think that that's what's happening. He's, he's going in and pushing the nations out of the way. So it's mm. like... A clearing kind yeah, of? Yeah, almost like a destroying them as he swims. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it, 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 it's, it's really hard to know what the trickery of their hands is, but it's got something yeah. to do with them swimming, right? Right. So the idea of probably... Um, 
the trickery, the trickery of their hands could even be like um, using idols and stuff like that and mm. charms to to get people. But but either way, God's going to wipe them out. And so the idea of a swimmer pushing them to the side as he pushes, like a swimmer pushes water away, is yeah. probably probably what it's getting okay. at. Yeah, yeah, interesting image. Yeah. All right. So that's that's an okay. Now then we go to chapter twenty six. So we're we're basically just marching right along. So we've in chapter twenty five or twenty four, we've got basically talking about the destruction yeah. of the earth. Then in chapter twenty five, there's praise to God and this banquet is talked about. Then we get into twenty six, and now there sounds like it's more um, a song of trust, which which hmm. talks about Mount Zion being secure and the people that are dwelling in it really safe. So I think that's probably what's going on. So look at uh, the first part of 26. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. It's, he sets up its walls and ramparts for security, even the gates that the righteous uh, nation may enter and, that, and one that remains faithful. A steadfast, mind will, uh, a steadfast mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Um, that perfect peace, that's... Shalom, shalom, oh. when it's repeated, wow. and that's where you get that idea of perfect peace. But you can huh. see what's going on. He's saying, we have a strong city. I'm assuming it's Mount Zion, yeah. right, where God is dwelling, and he's, and he's restored the nation, and God's protecting them now. So now they're, they're, it's like a song of trust that they trust this God who's going to keep them secure. Yeah. And so that seems to be what, what this part of that oracle is about. Yeah. Now, so so that's how it, the first part is. That's for the righteous, okay? But now look at um, um, verse 9 through 10 is kind of interesting. At night, my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit um, within me uh, seeks you diligently. For when the earth experiences your judgment, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. So basically what it's saying is that when God punishes the earth, the the earth should learn righteousness because they're yeah. seeing these people are justly being punished because they've, they've either harmed God's people or they've yeah. been wicked to God and, and they've rebelled against him. So they're going to be punished. And that's the justice they're seeing. So he calls it that they will learn righteousness. They'll mm. see this was a righteous punishment by God. Okay? Though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. That's interesting. It sounds like to me that God can be quite gracious to a sinner, and it doesn't really do a whole lot of good. They do, it mm. doesn't change their ways. They still are going to act out in their wickedness. Yeah. Okay? Um, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly with the land, in the land of uprightness. So it sounds like that here's a, here's a, a, land, a good land, and he's, he's acting wickedly even in that good land. Yeah. Um, and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. So it's interesting. The wicked, even though God's gracious to them, it doesn't seem to change their actions at all. Right. Okay. So, but the punishment will. Th yeah. Th that they'll they'll see that and and know that this God is a righteous God. Yeah, I see a, yeah. A, an image returning in our next verse. Yeah, yeah you see that. Don't the you? hand is lifted <laughs> up. They do not see it. Yeah, that's just like our uplifted hand oracles. God had yeah. to punish them. Yeah. But it didn't didn't seem to do any good, so he had to keep punishing him more. Yeah. 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 Good. All right. Um, uh, okay, let's look at verse 12. The Lord will establish peace for us. Now, the us must not be the wicked, right? They're right. gonna they're gonna be going through punishment. Yeah. So so it's these inhabitants of Zion. Yeah. So it'd be that remnant that's left. Mm -hmm. Since you have uh since you have performed for us all our works, O Lord our God, you uh, other masters besides you have ruled us, but though you alone, but through you alone we confess your name. So even though this remnant has been mastered by other people, they haven't given in and served them. They still are serving God. So this is a righteous remnant. I think that's what's getting at. Mm. Okay, uh, the dead, uh, the dead will not live. The departed spirits will not rise. Therefore, you have punished them and destroyed them. So basically, it's saying that the wicked. Are not going to write. Uh, you know their yeah. their punishment is going to be a punishment, and there's not going to be any restoration mm. from that. Mm. Okay. Um, Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them. You have wiped out all remembrance of them. You have increased the nation, O Lord. 
You have increased the nation. You have, uh, you are glorified. You have extended the borders of the land. So, so why are the, the wicked are being punished? God's people are being restored yeah. and, and even more. Yeah. It's growing. It seems yeah. things are getting better. Okay. Now look at, um, Look at verse nine. Um, uh, I wanted. Look at verse sixteen. Oh Lord, you saw you. Uh, they sought you in distress. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening was upon them. As a pregnant woman announces approaches a time to give birth, she rises and cries out in her labor pains. Mm. Thus were we before you, O oh Lord. We were pregnant. We were writhing in labor. We gave birth, as it seems, only to wind. We could only accomplish deliverance for the. Uh, we could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor the inhabitants of the world. So basically, he's saying, is God's people were doing their best to to serve God, and it didn't work. And they, yeah. the only way it could happen is if God does it. Yeah. Okay. Now look at verse nineteen. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. Uh, you who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. Uh, so basically, the you is the remnant. They're dead. Hmm. The believing remnant will arise. Yeah. So, so God's dead will live. The wicked are going to be punished and, and yeah. continue to be punished. Um, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Come, my people. Oh, now the next part's really interesting. But let's just summarize for a minute. So it sounds like to me, God's got this remnant that's being protected. They are going to live, and God's people are going to be um, protected and living in Mount Zion and all that. Yeah. The wicked, their dead are not going to live, and my understanding is that means they're still going to be in their place of judgment, mm. um, in that lake of fire, I assume, is what that means, and they're not going to get out of that. Yeah. So it sounds like to me that's what's happening. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. All right, now let's look at verse 20. Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the uh, indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord... Is, okay, l- let me just stop there. So, so God's people are to run into somewhere and hide while there's indignation. Now, that would make sense if there's a... And, and it's real and clear how this is going to happen. I don't know where the places they're going to be protected. I don't know any of that. But what does sound like ha- is happening is that God's people are going to be protected Well, when the rest are going to feel the indignation of the Lord. Yeah. Now, if that's the tribulation, okay, the, the people in the tribulation could be protected in it mm. or they could be taken out of it. Mm. I There's a, this dilemma of whether the tribula- or the, the rapture is before the tribulation yeah. or at, or uh, in the middle or after. Mm-hmm. It seems like to me, either way, this is saying that God's people are going to be protected in yeah. it. Okay? Yeah. All right. So the Lord is about to come from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will real, uh, reveal their bloodshed and no longer cover their slain. So mm. remember, that's going back to that eternal covenant where yeah. the wicked even killed other people. Yeah. And, and, and so they're going to be punished for that 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 wickedness that they've got. All right, does that one make sense? Yeah, it's interesting. It says the earth will will reveal her bloodshed. Yeah. We're no longer covered. It, it, it reminds me of uh, um, Cain and Abel. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. It does kind of remind me of like the blood yeah. and the land, and yeah. kind of it cries out. Right. So there'll be no way to hide their sin, is what I yeah. think it's getting at. Even yeah. though they've tried in the past to protect, to hide their sin, yeah. I think what this is saying, there's no way that's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's that's what I think it's getting at. Okay, so we are at... So it sounds like to me this is the time of the tribulation when God's people are going to be protected, but the rest are going to feel God's indignation. Mm-hmm. And if you go to the book of Revelation, you've got those judgments that are coming on the earth, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, now, it, wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me that um, the, the Isaiah is, is, is even more unclear. I mean, it's it's there. It's veiled even more about who mm. it's referring to. Mm. I think the, uh, the book of Revelation, Revelation has a lot more detail, but this is certainly given the core 
that would fit right in. There's nothing that I can see in the book of Isaiah that that would be negated when you get to the book of Revelation. Mm. Just is further explained. It seems like to I me. see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, what happened is is Isaiah is looking in the future. He's given the the some some really key points of what's going to happen. The book of Revelation is going to explain those key points even better. In further detail. Yeah. yeah. Really expand on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. We're now done. We've got one more chapter. Yeah. Okay. Chapter 27. And look at verse one, probably, probably the, the most interesting verse. In that day, the Lord will punish the Leviathan, oh yeah. the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword. Even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. <laughs> Don't ask me any questions. Yeah. Like <laughs> I'm here to ask the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who is the Leviathan? I know. Um, it would, now, it certainly is a picture of evil. So at the okay. very least, you could say this is a picture of evil that God's going to destroy. Mm. Okay. Um, when, when it says, um, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea... Often when it talks about the sea, that means the nations. Like when you get to the book of mm. Daniel, it talks about these dragon or these four beasts coming out of the sea. Yeah. That means they're coming out of the world, the, the earthly or the human world. Okay. And I think that that's what this is. With the dragon that's coming out of the sea must mean the, a, a, a being or something that's coming out from the human world that's there. Okay. And if that's true, that, that could be... Um, now, I've said it's definitely a picture of evil. Mm -hmm. Could it be Satan? Because it's a personification of evil? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes. That, mm. that would fit just fine. And, yeah. and for sure, Satan is going to be destroyed you know, with his fierce and great and mighty sword. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a problem with saying that this evil is now personified in the book of Revelation as the beast, the false prophet, Satan. All yeah. of those would fit just fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that verse is very difficult, but it does seem like it fits into the um, book of Revelation really well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, the next thing we have is do you remember in chapter five, we had that um, song of the vineyard, I called it, and it talks about yes. how bad the vineyard was? Right. This is now the song of the good vineyard. Okay? okay, so so verses seven uh, or two through uh, eleven is going to talk about a vineyard that God's going to protect. Look what He says: In that day, a vineyard of wine, sing of it. Or I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water it every moment so that no one will damage it. I guard it night and day. I have no wrath. Should anyone give me briars and thorns? Remember, briars and thorns was that key phrase of yeah. worthless things yeah. back in chapter five. Um, I would step on them. I would completely burn. I would burn them completely. Um, so basically, you've now got a picture of a, a vineyard that, that God's protecting and taking care mm -hmm. of. Now, that fits really well, because before, the vineyard of the Lord was, was you know, sour grapes, do you remember? And right. Israel needed punishment. Yeah. But now it sounds like the punishment is over, and God's now protecting his vineyard. Yeah. So it, it, it makes perfect sense in my mind that it fits in here now. Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. So that goes all the way to about verse 11. All right. Now look at verse 12. In that day, the Lord will start his threshing from the uh, flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of, of, of Egypt. So you've got two rivers on both sides of, uh, you know, the Euphrates River. Um, it, it, that's usually thought to be the, the largest extent of the mm. land of Israel. Uh, the top of the Euphrates River okay. uh, uh, during David's time and Solomon's time, they actually had that, but only through alliances and stuff like that. Mm. And then the Brook of Egypt is probably not the Nile, but it's probably the, the Wadi of Egypt, which is, okay. is um, like at the bottom of of Israel's land, even today, there's it's a it's a boundary of it. So kind of east, uh, up in east of Egypt, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so it's it would be that boundary, uh, not even in the Sinai Peninsula. It's okay. it actually doesn't even cover all that. It's, okay. It's before it. Okay. All right. So you've got that, and and he will gather up. One by one, the sons of Israel. I will come up, and, and it will come about in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, and those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and who are scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. 
So that's, again, sounds like a time when there's going to be a gathering of that yeah. remnant at yeah. the end. Now, it's, it's also interesting. Notice it doesn't say Babylon. Right. It said Assyria and Egypt, yeah. both of countries which before Isaiah they, had, they knew they were going to go into, but it yeah. doesn't say anything about the Babylonians, which yeah. I think is interesting. So yeah. that, in my mind, helps us to see kind of the timing of this, of this mm. passage. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, so basically what it's saying is that there's going to be a time at the end when God's going to... There, and it even talks about um, a trumpet being blown. A great trumpet yeah. will be blown, and those who are perishing there will be drawn up to Mount Zion. Yeah. So my understanding is that this will be a collecting a, again a, a, in the future of his remnant. Yeah. So that, once again, fits the book of Revelation really well, it would seem like. Yeah, where I his think so. people are coming together yeah, they're in, gathered. To, to live in God's kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. That That is the little apocalypse. That's so fascinating. It's amazing because there's so many similarities to what it tells us God's going to do in the future in the book yeah. of Revelation. Yeah. Now, remember, this is just the hints of it and, yeah. and, and very um, brief explanation of it. The book of Revelation, in my mind, explains in much more detail what these things are, are talking about, I think. Yeah. Now, do you have any ideas of how maybe before Revelation was written, yeah. how people were you know, looking back at this little apocalypse? Yeah. How did they understand this? Well... Uh, Similarly? Yeah, kind of? I would think similarly. So they are seeing a time of punishment of the earth. Mm -hmm. They're seeing a time when there's going to be God's people that are collected and protected and a righteous remnant that are going to be protected by God. Um, they see a time when there's going to be this banquet where they're celebrating and there's not going to be any more mourning and stuff like that. So they, they actually do have quite a bit of, of revelation given there. Yeah. They've got this destruction of the Leviathan, whoever that is, or whatever that is. Yeah. And even if it's just a, the idea of evil being right. destroyed, right. God's destroying it. Yeah. Um, but I think you can even go a step further and think it's the evil one and yeah. be Satan or or the false prophet, probably any of those wicked people would fit into that. Yeah. Okay. And then talks about the vineyard that's going to be restored yeah. after all God's destruction on the earth. Right. And then you've got uh, this time when he's going to gather his remnant from the ends of the earth yeah. and bring them to Zion. Yeah. So all of those things would fit real well with what's going to happen in the future in the book of Revelation. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of great parallels there. Yeah. yeah. So that's why it's got its title. Yeah. The, the book, Little Apocalypse. The Little Apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> it's great because you don't know it just means short apocalypse. Yes. Yeah. I guess they probably don't want to call that short just because that maybe would imply the length of time or something like that. Yeah. But I like a little apocalypse. Like <laughs> Yeah. As though it's not a big deal or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It sounds like it be, it's going to be a big deal, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> but, yeah. but but it's it's much, much less explained. Yeah. And you'll see a lot more in the book yeah. of Revelation. It's a big framework, though. Yep. I mean, it seems like a lot of Revelation builds on this and yeah. really is dependent on it in a lot of ways. Yep. I think so. Okay. So should we go into the next section? Well, what do we have next? We've got... Okay, let's... Take it further. Do you remember? Uh, I've talked about. The, the, I told you before there were these nine woe oracles that are balanced off by these restoration oracles. Yeah. So, so you've got the oracles to the nations in uh, thirteen to twenty-three, mm -hmm. then the little apocalypse twenty-four through twenty-seven, and then right in the heart of this polystrophe, you've got the this really unusual. Uh, structure. You've yeah. got woe oracles or judgment oracles that are balanced by a restoration. Yeah. And, and the first one might help us to get kind of a picture of what they're like. Okay. So why don't we look at it? Yeah. Here, we, here we've got uh, chapter 28, verses 1 through 4. And let me read it, because then when we read verses 5 through 6, it'll, it'll see, because they use a lot of the same kind of terminology. Yeah. Um, so look, look at what it says. Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. Now, remember Ephraim was the um, uh, highlands of Ephraim, that area up north, yeah, yeah. That and all that was left of, of Israel in Isaiah's time. Yeah. Um, the northern kingdom was 
greatly reduced because of Syria. Yeah. So that's highlighting that area. Now, yeah. Ephraim also would have the capital, uh, the highlands of Ephraim would have a, their capital, Samaria. Right. So when it talks about the proud crown, the crown goes up on the head, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk about a mountain. Uh, and I've got, I've got a picture here of uh, Samaria, and can you see that there's a, it's a bunch of mountain ranges? Mm -hmm. But that one there is where Samaria itself was located, okay. which is, in their minds, on a hill. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so it says, Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of its glory. So you already know that it's on its downward trend, yeah, right? Right. Um, which is at the head of a fertile valley and of who... Uh, of those who are overcome with wine. So a fertile valley would mean that in between those, the, the mountain and, and going up mm. to it, yeah. is, and Samaria is very fertile. And these, these valleys is where, uh, are where most of their food is made, mm. or a lot of their food is yeah. made. Okay? All right. Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty agent as a storm of hail and a tempest of destruction, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. Now, let me just stop there. Those two things are going to help us. Who was the ones, uh, what nation wiped out the northern kingdom? Syria, what you said, right? Assyria, yes. Yeah. So when it says, I, the Lord has a strong and mighty, a mighty agent, that's Assyria. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay? And, and, and notice it also says, um, a storm of hail, a tempest of destruction, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. Do you remember chapter 7, or chapter 8, had that same image of uh the, the, the Israel had gone with Syria, and what had happened is that they had linked up together and gone against Judah. Right. And so God says he's going to bring the Euphrates on them. Do you remember oh. that abundant water? Right. Yeah. Right. So, so it seems like to me that, that that storm of mighty overflowing waters would fit the Assyrians real well too, yeah. even back from chapter 8. Yeah. Okay, so uh, he has cast it down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot. So when it's talking about a crown, I think it's talking about the top, and that's where Samaria itself was. So I think yeah. what it's saying is that Samaria itself is going to be tr right. trodden underfoot. Right. Okay? The fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley. So it's again, it's at the top. It will be like first uh, ripe figs uh, prior to summer, when, which one when sees them, as soon as it's, it's in his hand, he swallows it. Hmm. And it, uh, I'm not, I, I guess that just means that the Assyrians really want to eat those yeah, figs bad. Right, right. <laughs> okay? All right, so that's, that's the first part. That's the judgment oracle. Okay. All right? Now, look at verse 5. In that day, well, which day are we talking about? The day that they're being destroyed, right? The Lord of hosts will come like uh, become a beautiful crown, a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. So he's using the same images mm. from that earlier judgment oracle yeah. and saying that now God's going to be that glorious diadem for the remnant of his people. Yeah. Okay? All right, does that make sense? So we're yeah. getting, it's, it's using those same images, but now applying them and saying, oh, God's going to do it, and it's going to be done to the remnant of his people. So the model here is like we're going to get some imagery yes. in the oracle, yeah. and then that kind of gets, uh, maybe spin isn't the right quite word, but it kind of gets expanded or, or, or used, used for the in next some time. other kind of way, Yeah, specifically about how God is going to... Now, not all of them, but this okay. one, this one's the clearest one where yeah. it happens. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm not done. Look at verse 6. Mm. A spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment, a, a strength for those who rebe repel at the onslaught at the gate. So it sounds like it's talking about this... Uh, a spirit of judgment for whom who sits in that a spirit of justice would mean a righteous judge who's yeah, yeah. making these decisions and strength to those who are repelling those that come against it. Right. So so God is going to be their protection. He's going to be their righteousness, their judge, yeah. all that. So it's it's telling when you see a picture of Samaria who's being anything but righteous and just and all that. Yeah, they're going to be destroyed by God's mighty agent. While his people, his remnant, is going to be protected by God, and his the righteous are going to his justice and righteousness are going to be there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the first one. Yeah. But but you see, it's interesting that it's got that judgment, and then using those same images. Yeah. Now the element of restoration. Right. So that's right. Whoops, uh, so that's our first um, woe to the drunkards I've mm -hmm. got there. 
Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, a lot of these, it, let me, before we go on, notice it's the next one's to the leaders, the next one's to the leaders, the next one's to Ariel. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Should be E-L. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to Ariel, then the, the rebellious ones, the unbelieving ones, to women even, mm -hmm. and then the destroyers punish. So it's really interesting. All of these woes or judgment or oracles are against what looks like the leaders of Israel. Right. Because they're the ones that are, are mainly the wicked ones because the, the, the people are just having to follow them. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Let's look at the next one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go back. So that one was the first one. Mm -hmm. Here's the second one. It's the judgment oracle, restoration oracle. The mm -hmm. judgment is to the leaders in verses 7 through 15, and then the restoration. So let's see what the judgment is. And those who reel from wine and stagger from strong drink, the priests and the prophet reel with strong drink. They, can, they are confused by wine. They stagger from strong drink. They reel while having visions. They totter while rendering just uh, judgments. Boy, if you think about yeah. it, that's pretty bad, right? Really so, laid into them. Yeah. yeah. So here's the priests and prophets that are supposed yeah. to be leading their people. Instead, they're just as drunk as the other people. Right. And in fact, when they're supposed to be doing their visions and their um, judgments, yeah, they're, they're doing it out, around, of the, yeah. out of drunkenness. Right. Okay? Um, it, you can see Isaiah uses drunkenness as a real picture of... of, of Debauchery that they that yeah. they're corruption. They're not they're not doing things right because they're so inebriated they don't they don't even know yeah. what to do. Yeah, I mean that's really how we describe yeah. Ephraim as well. Yeah, just, yeah, you know, not we how yeah. Isaiah describes yeah, yeah. him a few verses earlier. Yeah. Okay, look at verse eight. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit without a single clean spot. So that lets you know how just how bad it is. Yeah, here, bad. here they're at their feast, they're having their feast, and they're they they got yeah. vomit all over it. Yeah. All right. To whom would you teach knowledge? Uh, to whom would you interpret a me message? Just those weaned from milk or just those taken from the, be uh, the breast? For he says, or order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, here, here uh, a little here, a little there. Indeed, he will speak to this people. Now, I think what he's getting at is that these people are so drunk that they need to be taught hmm. a lesson and God's going to teach them a very difficult lesson, mm. but what's going to be is it's going to be so simple that even an idiot should get it, Yeah, right? A child should be able to get, yeah. if you do it line upon line, uh, right, statute right. upon statute, um, here, there, uh, here a little, there a little, they ought to be able to get it, and I think that's what he's doing. Mm. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. What's that mean? Yeah. <laughs> a foreign tongue. Yeah. It's from outside. So... Uh, so you're Assyrians probably, yeah, I right? Think, yeah, it's probably like, yeah. So for, for, for them, the Assyrians would have been a language they didn't know. Yeah. So he's going to bring on them a But they're still going to understand the lesson. He's going to understand the judgment, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. He will say to them, here is a rest, give, give, uh, here is rest given to the weary, here is repose, but they would not listen. So God wanted to help them. So the word of the Lord will be to them like order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line. So he's saying it's going to be a very stiff punishment, a very, um, it's going to be very fair. They're going to know that, yeah. but it's going to, it's going to hurt. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, the last part that they may, that they may go and stumble backward and be broken, snared and taken captive. Now remember, we've we've already said this is talking about that northern kingdom. Yeah. So the northern kingdom is going to fall backwards and be taken captive. Yeah. So it fits really well. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got the message to the leaders. The uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's two more parts. Uh, two more verses. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, or uh, who rule the people. Um, who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with show we have made a pact, the overwhelming scourge will not reach us uh, when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge, and we have concealed ourselves with deception. Now, they're certainly not saying this, right? Because no hmm. one in their right minds would say, oh yeah, we've made a pact with death right. so that when it comes, we're not gonna, yeah. we're not gonna feel it. And, yeah. and, our, uh, and our, we've made falsehood our, dis our refuge. Right. 
But what they're, I think what God's talking about here is that, that they, they've made a covenant with Egypt. Mm-hmm. And, and this is probably around 701 because a lot of these passages seem right right about that time before the Assyrians come. Okay. And, and their, their covenant that they made with Egypt was that they thought they would get out of it because Egypt would spare, it would mm-hmm. help them fight against the Assyrians and they'd be spared. Yeah. It didn't work. They got right. wiped out really quick. And yeah. so, so in God's, God's having Isaiah say, no, they've made falsehood as their refuge, and mm-hmm. uh, and they've concealed themselves with deception. So what they're saying is, what we thought was going to work is not going to work. Right. God's letting them know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's that's the second one against the leaders. And here and and now we're going to see the restoration oracle in seven, uh, sixteen and seventeen. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for a foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. I will make justice the majoring line and righteousness the level. Then hail will swept away the refuge of lies, and waters will overflow the secret places. Hmm. So, so basically, now you get this idea of a cornerstone back in the New Testament, right? Where oh, yeah. Jesus is the cornerstone. Yeah. Now, so in my mind, we just went over that in my church. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So a cornerstone. I've got a picture here of a cornerstone. Everything mm. is supposed to be laid out based yeah. upon that cornerstone. They measure everything. Yeah. So possible interpretations could be that could be the scripture. Mm. It could be uh, the law mm-hmm. is is something that he's laid in Zion, so they're going to know what they're supposed to do. Yeah. It could be God's plan for Zion, right? Because he's mm. he's told them that he's going to restore the land and all that, and that could be the cornerstone that they should be judging their lives against. Yeah, um, it could be the Messiah. Mm-hmm. I even think it could be Isaiah. Because if you think about it, Isaiah That's what a prophet was. Does. Yeah, yeah, he came to the nation to tell them the right things to do, yeah. and that could be the cornerstone that God's placed in the land so that they could live according to it. Yeah. So I think all of those are possible. I, I would probably prefer Isaiah hmm. because that one seems to fit in their understanding of what they would know at that point. But I, I don't think I could rule out the others. And, and certainly, uh, some of them are going to be connected, like God's plan for Zion and Isaiah. Isaiah is the one that told them that. Right. Um, the plan, right. The, the God's plan for uh, Zion also has the Messiah in it. Yeah. So, so it could fit all three of those things, yeah. and that could be the cornerstone. And yeah. he never really does say it, but he does say that those who believe in the cornerstone will not be disturbed. Yeah. So whatever God's plan is, or the Messiah, well, or Isaiah's message, if they believe in that, they'll be established. And, and it's going to bring justice and righteousness, and that yeah. kind of defines how yeah. things go forward. Yeah. So it, it's just interesting. I think that one fits. And it's The cornerstone image is, is now, it's later going to be picked up in the New Testament and applied to Christ. Mm-hmm. And certainly we can see why. Yeah. He's the one that everything is judged against. Yeah. So, yeah. but it's interesting that that's the second one. Yeah. Okay. All right. We can now go to the third. The third judgment oracle is to the leaders, mm-hmm. and we're going to start at the, verse. So this 18. is the third judgment oracle, yep. second to the leaders. Yep. Okay. Verse um, eighteen. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Verse eighteen. So okay. I'm in verse uh, t- or chapter twenty-eight, verse eighteen. Your covenant with death will be canceled. Now that's the second time they've mentioned that covenant with death yeah. or covenant with Sheol. Yeah. Okay. Um, and your pact with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, then uh, you will become its trampling place. So now that would make sense. If this is they they thought the Assyri- Egypt was going to help them against the Assyrians, in fact that tramp the. Um, scourge is going to be the Assyrians when they come through, they're still going to get trampled. Yeah. So that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. As often as it passes through, it will seize you. For morning after morning, it will pass through anytime during the day or night. It will be sheer terror understa- uh, to understand what it means. Now, let me stop there. That means, uh, means Assyria is going to come through more than once. Mm. And that makes sense. You know, it came through in 722 to wipe out the Northern right. Kingdom, right. 701 to wipe out Judah mostly. Uh, it comes back even later. Yeah. Okay. So so it does make sense that and, and it says that every time it comes through, it's gonna be sheer terror to understand yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Then it then it gives an illustration. The bed is too short on which to stretch the bank the blanket is too small to wrap oneself in. Uh, 
you're probably tall, so you probably understand that one real well, right? <laughs> yeah. A bed with your feet are hanging over, oh, and, yeah. and your the blanket never covers your you know, to keep you warm. Yeah. Right. So for the Lord will rise up on Mount Perim and will stir up the Valley of Gibeon. Uh, uh, to uh, to, uh, to his task, his unusual task, to the work of uh, to to do the work uh, to to work his work, his extraordinary work, uh, and now to carry out uh, to ask scoffers on the fetters will be made strong. I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a decision of destruction on on all the earth. So there's kind of a summary about this punishment that's going to happen, it's going to, in their mind, it's going to cover the whole of, of Israel, and mm. it's going to even go beyond that, you know, because remember the Assyrian Empire wiped out even more nations. Yeah. So so that would fit that really, really well, it would seem like. Yeah. Um, so we're at, uh, just got done with the uh, woe to the ju- the leaders in verse 22. Now in verse 23, give ear uh, and hear my voice. Listen and hear my words. Listen, t- uh, for does the farmer plow continually to plant seed? Does he continually turn and harrow the ground? Does he not level its surface, sow dill and scatter cumin? The plant uh, and plant wheat in rows, barley in its place and rye in its area. For uh, for his for his God instructs and teaches him properly. For dill is not threshed with threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel driven over cumin. But dill is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a club. Grain for bread is crushed. And indeed, he does not continue to thresh it forever, because the wheel of its cart and its horses will eventually damage it. He does not thresh it uh, it longer. Let me just stop there. Do you see what he's getting at? He's using the the farmer as an illustration that yeah. says a farmer only plows the ground a little, you know, first to get it ready for planting, yeah. and then he puts the seed in. Yeah. If he continued to plant, or I mean, if he continued to plow, what would happen yeah, he's is he's going to destroy the plants. Yeah, so he, he'd throw the 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 seed in there; it'd be a waste of his time because yeah. he'd be, keep tearing it up. So God's saying that's what judgment is like. I know that there's a certain amount of judgment that I need to make sure that they understand it. But if I continued to judge them forever, th- they would give up and they and we'd lose them all. Mm. So I think what he's saying is here's here's the take the wisdom of the farmer, watch how he does it and that's how your God is going to treat you too. Yeah. So th- I think that's really neat. Yeah. Because that's like our uplifted hand oracle, right? Mm. Here's God with his hand up coming down in punishment, they don't get it, so he gives them a little more. They don't get it, so he gives them a little more. He doesn't just totally wipe them out. He gives them a little punishment at a time, so that hopefully they'll learn from it. And some of them will. Now, yeah. not all of them, but some of them will. Yeah, it's a good image. Yeah. Um, I don't think we usually imagine threshing as like punishment. It's yeah. cultivation. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Um, yeah. But that's really that's really how. God's punishment is fitting in at this. It's yeah. for correction. It's to be better. You and know? you can see how in ground, when ground is being plowed, it's being broken yeah, up yeah, and yeah. split apart. Yeah. So that's probably a, a good, very good image, image of it. Yeah. 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 And then here, the last verse is, uh, this also comes from the Lord of hosts, who, who has made his counsel wonderful and his wisdom great. Mm-hmm. So he's saying, just like the farmer, so God is doing this, and it's great wisdom because he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. So that's a beautiful image, that is I think. a good verse. Yeah. yeah. All right, that's, that's the, the third one. Okay. We're now the fourth one. The fourth one is interesting. Um, look what it says. It starts out with, Woe, O Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped. So from now on, it's, never go, it's not really going to tell you who Ariel is, hmm. but you got the first hint where David once camped there, and then in a minute it'll give us even more. Add year to year, observe your feasts on schedule. I will bring distress to Ariel. Now, why this is actually interesting, Ariel means um, uh, lion of God, it, if you looked at the word itself. Yeah. But a, a little change of that means an altar hearth or where a burning takes place. So hmm. like an altar or a, a thing. So so it's a little play on the word. He uses it to Ariel meaning... Uh, to call the the lion of God or you know the city where David once once uh, camped, but then he's going to say, "But I'm going to bring it judgment on it, and it's going to be an altar heart." Oh. So look what it says, and she will be like an aerial to me. 
I will camp against you, encircling you. I will set siege works against you. I will raise up battle towers against you. Then you will be brought low from the earth you will speak, from the dust uh, uh, where you are prostrate. Your words will come. Your voice will also be like that of a spirit from the ground. Your speech will whisper from the dust. So, so when he sets up these siege works, and once again, that fits 701 pretty well. Mm. The Assyrians, that they use siege works and stuff like that. So he says, I'm going to punish you and I'm going to make you like an aerial. And that's that play on the words. So I'm going to make you like an altar hearth oh. where judgment is going to come. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right. So that's that's basically... Now it goes... It keeps going. Um, uh, but the multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust. So he's going to... going to. Uh, correct them. Um, look at verse eight. It will be when a hungry man dreams, behold, he is eating, but when he wakens, mm. his hunger is not satisfied. Or when his thirsty man dreams, behold, he is drinking, but when he awakes, behold, he is faint and his thirst is not quenched. Thus the multitude of all the nations who wage a war against Mount Zion. So basically he's saying all those that go against Mount Zion, I'm going to step in, and at some point they're going to think they get the food, or they think that they're they're dreaming they get the the, yeah, the drink, but it won't. But it won't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, be delayed and wait. By, uh, blind yourself and be blind. Um, they have become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out uh, uh, over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes. The prophets um, shut. Uh, your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your heads, the seers. So basically he's saying, uh, your eyes are the prophets and your uh, head is the seers, mm. meaning meaning that the, the one that should be guiding them and helping them to know what God wants, yeah. they're blinded. They can't, yeah. yeah. Okay? Okay, uh, verse 11 is kind of neat. The entire vision will be to you like words of a sealed book, which when they give it to you, to one who is literate, says, please read this. He says, I cannot, for it's sealed. Then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, please read this. And he will say, I can't read it, or I cannot read. So he's, he's saying that I'm giving you this judgment. I'm even telling you about it, but because you're so blind, you're not going to be able to use it. You're, yeah. you're not going to, you're, you're going to reject it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. All right. Let's skip down uh, to verse 17. So okay. uh, it's still going to talk about the punishment and judgment. But now when we get to 17, now the restoration comes in. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is, uh, is it not just a little while before Lebanon will be turned into a fertile field and the fertile field will be considered a forest? Now, mm. first of all, Lebanon, uh, that's, that, you know, that's just north of Israel proper, but in a lot of, uh, like Egypt considered both Lebanon and Israel the same land. Oh, okay. So I think what it's getting at is that Lebanon is now a, a term for Israel that's that God's going to restore, hmm. okay? Um, you know, going to make it a f fertile field and then into a forest. On that day, the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. So that, remember before, they were literate, but they couldn't read yeah. it because the book was sealed? Yeah. Well, now they're going to be able to see it, yeah. okay? And they're going to understand it. The afflicted will also increase in their, in their gladness of the Lord, and the needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless will come to an end, and the, scor scoff, or the scorner will be punished or finished. Indeed, all those who are intent on doing evil will be cut off. Who, is, uh, who cause a person to be, be indicted by a word, who ensnare him and uh, uh, who in, in adjudicates at the gate and defraud the one in the right with meaningless arguments. So basically it's saying that at some point God's stepping in and going to protect his people. All right? Uh, it keeps going, but let's go to verse 22. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob will now it will not now be or shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face turn now turn pale. But when he he sees his children, the work of my hands, and in his midst they will sanctify my name. Indeed, they will uh, sanctify the holy one of Jacob, and it will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who err in mind will know the truth, and those who criticize will accept instruction. Wow. 
So you shift. got yeah. what a change, right? Yeah. And and some of those words are very similar to what you're going to see in in other oracles about God's restoration. Like in chapter thirty two, it's very similar to this, where they the mm. the blind will be able to see, and the yeah. those who err in mind are now going to know truth. Yeah. So you'll see those images again. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, so that's the fourth oracle of judgment and restoration. Yeah. So we're going How to... How many do we have again? There's nine of them. Nine. Yeah. So we're almost halfway through. Yeah. Okay, so the, the fifth one is uh, in chapter 30. And remember I told you that uh, there a lot of them are about the time period of 701 yeah. because it's talking about them going down and getting this, having this alliance or this covenant. Okay. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine. Who make an alliance, but not by my uh, by my spirit, in order to add sin to sin? Who pro- proceed down to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt? Now remember that was what they were doing in seven hundred one. But remember, yeah. we already know that's not going to work. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, it it goes on and explains quite a bit more of. Just it's it's like figurative, you know. It talks about the animals in the desert are going to see these, and mm. and you're going to see them. Um, but look at verse twelve. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, since you have rejected this word and have put your trust in oppression and guile and have re, uh, relied on them, therefore this iniquity will uh, will be to you like a breach about to fall, a bulge in the wall whose collapse will come suddenly in an instant, whose collapse will be like the smashing of a potter jar, so ruthlessly shattered that a shirt will not be found among the pieces to take uh, fire from the hearth or scoop out water from a cistern. So that tells you how bad the, yeah. they're, they're going to be shattered. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Let's do it just a little more. Verse fifteen. For the for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel has said, in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust, uh, uh, trust is your strength. But you were not willing, and he said, no. For we will flee on horses. Therefore you shall flee. We will ride on swift horses. Therefore you shall uh, those who pursue you shall shall be swift. One thousand will flee at the threat of one man, and you will flee at the threat of five until you are left as a flag on a mountaintop and a signal on a hill. So basically it's saying the destruction is they're going to be fleeing from the enemy, and there's going to be so few left of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. In, uh, in verse 15, uh-huh. um, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, yeah. uh, in repentance and rest you will be saved. Yeah. Rest is, I think, an interesting yeah. word. Is that kind of a like the opposite of them going after an alliance? Yes. Yep. In yeah. Egypt, like they should have been. Should have just really stayed home and faith, trust on God. So yeah. 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 You trust God. If you go to chapter seven, you've got those almost uh, chapter seven. I think it's verse. Uh, about nine, it actually says mm. a similar thing um, that they're supposed to just rest and stay in the land mm. and don't don't. You know, don't worry, the Syri for my war is during that time. And he says that if you just be quiet and stay there, I'll, de- I'll deliver you. Yeah. So it's, it's the same kind of image used there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now we're at the restoration. Mm-hmm. So starting, starting at verse 18. verse 18. Therefore, the Lord God longs to be great. Or the, therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion in you. For the Lord is the God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. So that's like the narrative part, or I mean the poetic part. Then the rest of this is basically the, the narrative that explains it, and it goes all the way to chapter 32. Or I'm sorry, 33, verse 33. Oh. Yeah. So it's... That's it's significant. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read a little of it so you can see what it's like. Okay. So verse 19 says, The people of Zion, inhabitant of Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. You will surely be, um, he will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Okay, then go down to verse 26. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. The light of the sun will be seven times brighter like the light of seven days. And the day of the Lord... And the day of the Lord binds up the fractured of his people and heals the bruise, uh, the bruise he has afflicted. Hmm. Um, that's an interesting image. You know, um, when it says the light of the sun will be like, or the moon yeah. will be like the light of the sun, yeah. and it'll be like seven times brighter. Well, 
that would actually harm us. You know, apparently right. the light's supposed to be, or the sun is supposed to be where it is. Yeah. If it was seven times brighter, it would yeah. cook us. Okay. Yeah. But, but what it's getting at is going to be uh, perfect. You know, the idea of, of perfection. Yeah. So the idea of it being like seven days would be like perfection. And, and you get that because it says, um, and the day of the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the bruise he has inflicted. Yeah. So it's the idea of restoration, not yeah. the idea of punishment. Yeah. Okay. Which which is a uh, it reminds me. Of, I think it's in chapter one. Which, there's a specific reference that like you know there's these wounds that haven't yes been, yeah in chapter been one pressed right. and like there no oil has been applied yeah. to them they haven't been healed there hasn't been any you yeah. know exactly yep so okay. Um, that's probably that's probably enough on that because it, okay. it's basically it's all the way to verse thirty three is the restoration. Yeah, and that's oracle. the end of the chapter. Yeah, okay. So let's go to the next oracle. Okay, the next one is the sixth one, mm-hmm. and it's um, in chapter thirty one. This one only has three verses, the judgment part, and look what it says: "Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help." So, so once again, it's yeah. that same pretty specific. Yeah, that yeah. same idea. Okay. Um, uh, they rest on. Mm. They rely on horses and trust in chariots because there are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. So that's the key. Um, they're going to Egypt to get help instead of going to God. Mm. Okay. So okay. So that's the woe oracle or the judgment oracle. Then um, look at verse four. Thus says the Lord uh, to me: As a lion or a young uh, lion growls over its prey against which that band of of shepherds is called out. He will not be terrified at his voice, nor disturbed at his noise. So the Lord of hosts will will come down to wage war on Zion and on its hill, like flying birds, so that the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. So here's the idea of restoration. So so even though, okay, remember in 701, they called on the Egyptians for Mm -hmm. help. The Egyptians couldn't help him, but God did, and he's and he says he's like a bird hovering over uh-huh. Jerusalem, attacking anyone who comes after them. Right, and that's that's the image that's left there. Yeah. Okay, so it goes all the way. This one actually has a really long one, but if you see my picture, here's my picture of that's an Egyptian chariot mm-hmm. who are who they call and and even got horses, which they called the plan, and it, and God says that's not my plan. Yeah. You should have relied on me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he goes back. Go back. Um, look at verse nine. His rock will pass away because of panic, and his princes will be terrified at the standard. Declares the Lord. Fire is in Zion, and those and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So, so that's that. Um, a furnace is like it's almost like God um, doing. A, uh, making iron, you know, mm-hmm. how it's it's almost like his workplace. So Jerusalem okay. and Zion is going to be the place where he does this, and it's like his workplace where he pours out a judgment on the other people yeah. that come yeah. after him. Now look at verse thirty-two. Behold, a king will reign righteously, and princes justly will rule justly. Each one will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like a shade of a huge rock in a parched land. When the eyes of those who see will not be blinded, and the ears of those who hear will listen, and the mind of the hasty will discern truth, and the tongue of the stammerer will hasten to speak clearly. So let me just stop there up to that point. So you've got a king ruling on Zion, protecting it, right? Right. And 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 remember at that time it's saying that people you wouldn't expect to be able to get the truth are be able to go, are going to be able to do it. Yeah. So so the ones who the mind of the hasty will discern truth, the tongue of the stammers will listen to speak it will hasten to speak clearly. That uh, no longer will the fool be called a noble or the rogue be spoken of as generous for the fool is as the fool speaks nonsense and his heart inclines toward wickedness. So it's saying that those people that are fools are going to be able to be the 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 people in Zion are going to be able to pick those out and say, "Oh, that's oh. a wicked person." And yeah. and so that means that means that they're 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 righteous and they're actually now yeah. have the truth of God who's right. changing their lives even. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's that's why this is talk this is the part of the restoration. 
Okay, that goes all the way to verse 8. The verse 8 says, but the noble man devises noble plans, and by the noble plans he will stand. Hmm. So that's kind of a summary of, of all the, the this king's going to come and rule, and he's going to rule in righteousness and justice, and yeah. the people in his kingdom are going to be able to tell the difference between wicked and righteous. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how that yeah. restoration works. Kind of reminds me of that cornerstone image yeah, yeah. we got a little earlier, you know, that that's kind of like... Good. That's what's going to define the righteousness and the justice kind of going forward. Yeah, you know? that's good. Okay, that's the sixth one. Okay. We'll go to the seventh one. Seventh one. It's starting at verse 9. Now it's directed towards the, uh, the unbelieving women. Okay? It's interesting. All these ones up to this point had been directed towards the leaders or the men in this, this, yeah. the, the city yeah. now, or the country. This one is towards the women. So, so it's letting you know the women are in as bad a situation as the leaders and the mm -hmm. men are. Okay. Rise up, you women who are at ease, and say and hear my voice. Listen to my word, you complacent daughters. Within a year and a few days, you will be in trouble, O complacent daughters, for the vintage is, the vintage is ended, and the fruit gathering will not come. Um, just so you know, when it says the vintage is ended, that means the grapes are gone, are, are finished, mm. and, and the fruit fruit gathering. So that means... Like it, the season is over? Yeah. yeah like it, that, it, is that kind of the... Yeah. So if there's no grapes to harvest, you're in trouble. And I think that's what it's getting at. You guys are in big trouble because in a, in a little over a year, basically your, your uh, vine, vineyards are going to be empty. Yeah. Um, you're going to... Uh, the fruit gathering, there's nothing to gather up. Mm -hmm. So that's really bad news for yeah. an agricultural country. Yeah, for sure. Okay? Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent daughters. Strip and dress and, and put sackcloth on your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields for the fr and fruitful vines, for the land of my people in which the thorns and briars shall come up. Yea, for all the joyful houses and... Uh, yea, for all the joyful houses and for the jubilant city, because the palace has been abandoned... The, populated city is forsaken. Hill and watchtower have become caves forever. Delight uh, for a wild donkey's, the deli a delight for a wild donkey and a pasture for the flock. So, so uh, a, a delight for a wild donkey would mean that's where a wild donkey would go to get his food and stuff. Right, yeah. right. Okay. It's become like a wild area. Yeah. Again. Yeah. All right. So we've got that, that's the first. That's the judgment part. Mm -hmm. Now we go to verse fifteen and through or through twenty, and that'll give you the restoration. Until the spirit is poured out on us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and a fertile field is considered a forest. That's the second time that image is used. Yeah. It, last time it was of Lebanon getting better. Yeah. Okay. Um, and justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field. The work of the righteous will be peace, and the service of the righteousness of righteousness and quietness and confidence forever. Yeah, and confidence forever. Then my people will live in peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in undisturbed resting places. And it will be as hail when the forest comes. Uh, it will be with hail when the forest comes down, and the city will be utterly laid low. How blessed will be you who sow, uh, who, who sow beside all the waters, who let, uh, let out freely the ox and the donkey. So basically, it's saying. Um, it's going to be a time of restoration and stuff like that. Mm. Um, it, it would be a time when the hail comes down. That's, that's I think, the, the judgment that was coming on the others. And then now how blessed it will be for you who sow by the, the quiet waters or by, uh, uh, by, by all the waters and who let out their donkey free and ox mm. freely, meaning they're not worried about anybody coming after them because oh, they can right. let them go wherever they want. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay. Okay. All right. That's the sixth one. Or that's seven. the seventh that's one. Seven. Now yeah. One to eight. We're in chapter thirty-three. Yeah. This should be the last one. And I had said earlier there was nine, but there's actually only eight of this them. This is the eighth one. This is the it. eighth and final. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Now this one is actually interesting. the The judgment oracle part is only one verse, and it's. But let's look at it, and I think you can figure out who it is. Woe to the destroyer! While you were not destroyed. And he who is treacherous, while others did not deal treacherously with him. Now, let me see if I can help you understand that. Um, the first empire was Assyria. Uh -huh. Assyria did not have anybody ahead of them that uh, had destroyed them or anything, mm. so that or, or, or had had treated anybody uh, the Assyrians uh, treacherously, so that they okay. could actually 
re- in repayment, treat them back that that okay. way. So when it says, uh, "Woe to you, destroyer, why you were not destroyed," means that there was no there. This was not in retaliation. There was nobody ahead of them that they. Uh, uh, destroyed to, to uh, that destroyed them yeah, so that they this retaliated. This is not a vengeance kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. So instead, this was them going out to destroy with nobody ever going after them to destroy them or anything like that. So yeah. it was it was not out of vengeance. So that suggests to me it's the first empire because yeah. there was nobody ahead of them to, yeah. to destroy them right. and they were retaliating. Yeah. Okay. So that means it's Assyria. All yeah. right. Um, who dealt treacherously with him. As soon as you finish destroying, you will be destroyed. As soon as you cease deal treacherously with others, you will de- uh, others will deal treacherously with you. So now that makes sense because yeah, we know the Babylonians yeah. did that to them. Right. Okay? Yeah. So, so that's our one judgment oracle, but I think it's pretty clear it's got to be Assyria, that first empire, yeah. who's not doing things in retaliation, but are going out punishing people just because they want to. Yeah. Okay? Okay. All right. Then we'll see the restoration, and this one's got a long restoration the rest of the chapter. Yeah. Okay? Um, It starts in verse 2. O Lord, be gracious to us, for we have waited for you. Uh, Be our strength every morning, our salvation also in a time of distress. At the sound of the tumult, the people flee. At the lifting lifting up of your nations... uh, nations disperse. I'm sorry, at the lifting up of yourself, Mm -hmm. nations disperse. Your spoil is gathered as a caterpillar gathers. You're as locusts rushing about, men rush about about on it. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. So that basically says, you know, here's God going out to protect his people. and, And even though the destroyer comes, you don't have to worry about the destroyer because God mm-hmm. is going to be their strength. Yeah. Okay? Um, it, there's a lot that goes in the, the next couple of verses, but if you look down at verse 13, you are, who are far, far away hear what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Uh, trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with a consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? Well, that would that's true because uh, the wicked wouldn't want to be with a righteous mm. God, yeah. right? Okay. He who walks righteously... So here's the answer to that question. Who can do it? Here's the answer. He who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity, who rejects un, unrighteous or unjust gain and shakes his hands so that they do not hold bribes, he who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking upon evil, he will dwell on the heights, his, re, his refuge will be in the impregnable rock, his bread will be given to him, and water will, his water will be sure. So God's going to protect the righteous one is what it's getting at. Yeah. Then your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will behold a far distant land. Your er, your heart will meditate on terror. Where is he who counts? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? Um, basically, it's saying there aren't any. Um, mm. uh, one who counts would be like a person who counts the enemy to see how strong they are. Or one who weighs would be they're weighing out the money to make sure they have enough money to, to go to battle yeah. or one who uh, counts the towers, um, making sure that they don't have to break down walls to make the, str- mm-hmm. the wall stronger. Yeah. And he's saying, um, they aren't any. Okay. Yeah. Um, you will no longer see a fierce people, a people of unintelligible speech, uh, which no one comprehends or a stammering tongue, which no one understands. The same thing, like the people Exa- from the outside. Good. Coming in. Yep. Yeah. So, and that's the image we had before earlier, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Okay. Look upon Zion, the city of, of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an undisturbed habitation, meaning nobody's going to come against it to take mm-hmm. them out. Okay. A tent will not be uh, folded. Its stakes will not be pulled up, nor will its cords be torn out. But there the majestic one, the Lord, will be for us. A place of rivers and wide canals on, on which no boat with oars will go and on which no mighty ships will pass. My understanding is that those are warships. Um, the ones that had oars were probably the uh, um, 
battleships that could ram other boats mm -hmm. and the ones with the big ships would be probably the ones that would go to battle. Yeah. Okay. But there aren't any for the judge uh, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our King. He will save us. Your tackle uh, hangs slack. It cannot hold the base of the ma mass firmly nor spread out its sail. Then the, uh, then the prey of the abundant spoil will be divided and lame will be taken plunder. <laughs> Let me make sure you understand that because that's like a figure of speech that's really compacted. When it says your tackle hangs slack and your, ba your mast can't be held tightly, mm -hmm. it means that this, the, the sh their ships are dilapidated. Oh. And yet, look at the next one. Huh. Um, uh, then the prey of the abundant spoil will be divided and the lame will be taken plunder. So it's saying that, that the people who are like, the lame will be actually gathering spoil and the uh, taking prey, meaning that even though they don't have the resources or the strength or anything to do that, they're still getting it, and I assume it's because God's giving it to them. Oh. Okay, so they're yeah. they're they're they don't need the ships any longer because God's going to be their protection, yeah. and the lame are going to be able to go out and take plunder and stuff because God's going to be doing the the fighting. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, verse 24, and no resident will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be uh, forgiven of their iniquity. Hmm. So that's telling us that Zion is that place where the, the king is dwelling. And I think that's the distant land it's talking about. It, it probably means that it's in the future. They'll see it mm -hmm. in the future, but it's coming, and God's going gonna, to you know, be there dwelling, uh, protecting them and taking plunder from the enemies for them and all that. Yeah. And, and they don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So that's that's that last one. Yeah. So this king will be ruling over a very peaceful country and they don't have to worry about ever being removed from it. Yeah. So does that make sense? That's I that, think so. That's yeah. the last one. Let, let me Yeah. Here's our oracles uh, that middle section of our palistrophe. Yeah. You had the oracles to the nations, then that little apocalypse mm -hmm, and which now we covered earlier. Yeah, yeah, and now we've just covered that oracles and restoration oracles. So you've got the woe oracles followed by restoration oracles. Yeah. And now and there's eight of them. Yeah. And that's that middle section. That's the center part. We've all been kind of yep. palistrophe kind of folds on that almost. Yes. That's where we're where every the focus is, right? Yep. And next week we'll talk about the final judgment restoration that once again will talk about the end times. Yeah. And then the Isianic narratives that once again will talk about that chapter 14, remember Assyria yeah. is yeah. going to be destroyed. Yeah. And that's what God will do to any nation that fights against him. And that's what this is going to explain. Okay. So that's where we're headed. Okay. Chapters 34 to 39. Yep. That's next week. Yep. Read up, everybody. Well, this has been a this has been a long episode again, uh, but uh, thank thank you everyone who stuck with us, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be back next week as we continue to study Isaiah. Yeah.